we have an important announcement for you as a part of pre parishan series 2023 we are going to conduct the first test on 28th and 29th of january this will be followed by live discussion of this test on 30th january for this you can opt for either online or offline mode to write the test for this you have to do is to register on elearn.rauis.com this test will help you to assess the real competition of upsc it will allow you to get your level of preparation and will also allow you to know how much more hard work is required to clear this examination further details of this test are given in the description box this is the lead article from page number 6 working hand in hand to showcase india this article has been written in the context of the tourism sector in india the article highlights various efforts taken by the ministry of tourism including the collaborative effort with the other ministries in this context from the point of view of the mains examination let us first discuss some of new and innovative ideas to promote tourism industry in india you can use them as case studies while you write answers for the mains and you can also use them freely as examples to your answers heritage and cultural tourism could be a niche area for promoting tourism in india because india is home to rich and diverse cultural heritage we have historical monuments temples palaces traditional villages all these can attract tourists from all over the world it will help preserve the cultural asset and also provide new tourism opportunities varanasi is known for its rich cultural heritage and spiritual significance and the city has been promoted as a cultural tourism destination by the government and the tourism boards among various other things there has been development of infrastructure we have museums cultural centers heritage walks that showcase the city's history and culture one fine example in this regard is the development of sarnath museum It houses artifacts and sculptures from the ancient Buddhist city of Sarnath which is located near Varanasi. There is lots of scope for development of cultural tours in the city and around focusing on city's religious heritage. We can develop the boat rides to Ganges along the coast to see the ghats and the temples. Visitors can also experience traditional Indian cuisine and observe the daily rituals of the city's resident. There is huge potential of promoting Khajuraho temples in Madhya Pradesh, Ajanta Ellora caves in Maharashtra and the Hampi temples in Karnataka. The Archaeological Survey of India and the state government have taken lots of effort to develop the Hampi temples. There has been lots of restoration work in the Virupaksha temple, in the Vittala temple, but there's a need of developing them as niche for more fulfilling and wider experiences in terms of handicrafts as well, local cuisines. and clubbing the heritage and cultural tourism with other forms of tourism maybe the dark sky tourism or the virtual reality tourism or the road trip tourism one of the suggestion is to promote the music tourism india is known for its rich tradition of music and music tradition and music tourism is an innovative way of showcasing it for example in the state of rajasthan music tourism can be promoted by offering tours of local music schools and providing hands on experience of learning traditional instruments and organizing activities like music workshops india is blessed with diverse landscapes and natural beauty including mountains forest wildlife developing adventure and ecotourism opportunities such as trekking camping wildlife safaris bird watching it can attract a new type of tourist and also help preserve the natural environment a fine example in this regard is the ecotourism development in kudairmukh national park it's in the state of karnataka and it is increasingly becoming a popular destination for trekking and bird watching in the andaman nicobar islands neel island ecotourism complex has been developed you must also have heard about birbiling paragliding site in himachal pradesh The whole Kullu Manali region of Himachal Pradesh it is involved in the infrastructural development for activities like paragliding rock climbing river rafting skiing visitors can also find adventure of camping where they can stay and experience various adventurous activities like rock climbing rappelling trekking many of you must already have visited Rishikesh it has the infrastructure for activities like rafting bungee jumping kayaking zip lining Similarly Khaziranga National Park you must have heard about there visitors can stay in eco lodges they are built using local materials and are designed to minimize the impact on the environment 
they have the mix of adventure and ecotourism. Same is the case with Sundarbans Reserve Forest. It is home to Royal Bengal Tiger and the forest there has been developed as ecotourism destination. We can promote this culture of ecotourism with adventure in India in the Tawang Monastery and the Sela Pass in Arunachal Pradesh. Also in the Silent Valley National Park in Kerala. There are many sites in the Nilgiri Hills where the potential of ecotourism and adventure tourism is very very high. India is known for its ancient health and wellness practices like Ayurveda, Yoga, Meditation. Developing wellness and spiritual tourism can attract tourists who are interested in the practices and also help preserve and promote traditional health and wellness practices. The city of Rishikesh is known as the yoga capital of the world. The city has been promoting wellness and spiritual tourism by developing yoga and meditation centers and promoting traditional Ayurvedic treatments. It has been a huge success in attracting tourists interested in wellness and spiritual practices. The effort the government and the tourism board have taken in Rishikesh has culminated in the well-known yoga and meditation centers like Parmarth Niketan, the Beatles Ashram. They are promoting yoga, meditation and also Ayurvedic treatments and natural therapies. Dharmshala in Himachal Pradesh similarly is known for rich spiritual heritage and wellness opportunities. The same is the case for Ladakh. Wellness and spiritual tourism can be developed as niche tourism in these areas. You know that India has a long coastline and the potential to develop cruise tourism is huge. This can be done by developing ports and infrastructure to handle large cruise ships and also by promoting the cruise industry to international tourists. There is a huge potential of promoting the cruise ship trips along the western coast and you tell me the reason for that. The ports of Mumbai, Goa, Kochi, they can provide a unique way to experience India's coastal beauty and culture. The Andaman and Nicobar Islands, they already are promoted as a cruise tourism destination by the government. Cruise tourism in Andaman Nicobar has been a huge success, attracting international tourists to experience the island's natural beauty and culture. There has been suggestions to develop cruise terminals in ports like the Mamaga port. Cruises can also be developed in the Mandovi River. The scenic beauty of the city of Goa through this river is breathtaking. So the idea of Ganga Vilas that you must have heard of in the newspaper, it can be extended for river cruises in Mandovi River and other rivers of peninsular India as well. India has a lot of potential in dark sky tourism, which involves visiting the area with little light pollution to observe the night sky. In Rajasthan, the state government can promote dark sky tourism by setting up observatories and camps in areas with little light pollution. And there's a huge opportunity to do this in the Great Thar Desert. The Great Himalayan National Park, located in the state of Himachal Pradesh, it is known for its remote wilderness and minimal light pollution. It is an ideal spot for stargazing and observing Milky Way and the phenomena like the Northern Lights. The Dholadhar Range, you must know this from your knowledge of geography, it is in Himachal Pradesh. This range is so well placed that it offers a perfect blend of nature and minimal light pollution. This range is very well known for its beautiful landscape, clear skies and excellent opportunities for stargazing. The Nilgiri Hills in the state of Tamil Nadu offers a blend of nature and minimal light pollution. It is also a very good spot for observing beautiful landscape having clear skies. It also gives opportunities for stargazing. There is a huge potential for dark sky tourism because India being a tropical nation. With the advancement in virtual reality technology, virtual reality tourism is emerging as a new way of experiencing a destination without actually traveling there. Companies like Google Street View, they are already offering virtual tours of destinations, allowing the tourists to experience a destination in virtual reality before they can plan a trip there. In India, there are some companies which have started to offer virtual reality tours of popular tourist destination like Taj Mahal, allowing people to experience the monument and the landmarks in an immersive way. This is one area where India should take lead because infrastructure is one of the crucial bottleneck in the entire tourism industry. And this technology helps us overcome that. Very few companies are presently working in this area, but this has a huge scope. With the advancement in technology and increasing interest in space exploration, space tourism is emerging as a new and innovative form of tourism. 
Companies like Virgin Galactic and the Blue Origin, they are developing commercial space travel options for tourists. It will give a new experience, a unique way of experiencing the space. With the Indian Space Research Organization making a significant strides in space exploration recently, space tourism can also be given thirst in India. For example, ISRO could offer a virtual reality tour of space stations. Or even better, maybe in the future, ISRO can offer a suborbital space flight for the tourists. There's also a concept of road trip tourism. Road trip tourism is a form of tourism where people travel to different places by car, motorbikes, or bicycles. Various states can promote road trip tourism by providing information on scenic routes, giving a proper road trip itineraries, and providing support for road trippers such as accommodation, repair services, among others. The Golden Triangle. This popular route connects the city of Delhi, Agra, and Jaipur. They are close by, perfect for a road trip. It has historical and cultural sites like Taj Mahal, Red Fort. Similarly, there are many circuits in which road trip tourism can be popularized. For example, the Himalayan circuit, connecting Jammu and Kashmir, Himachal Pradesh and Sikkim. This circuit has tourist destinations like Ladakh, Manali, Darjeeling. Road trip tourism circuits can also be developed along the eastern coast, along the western coast. One of the most exciting destinations for road trip tourism is the Konkan coast. We must also make effort to try and develop volunteer tourism. This form of tourism involves tourists traveling to a destination to volunteer their time and skills to work on projects that benefit local communities. For example, in India, various NGOs and private operators have been promoting volunteer tourism by offering various volunteering opportunities such as teaching English to underprivileged children, working on conservation projects. This niche area of tourism can be very well developed in Dharmshala. This hill station, as you would know in Himachal Pradesh, is home to a large Tibetan refugee population. It is already a very popular destination for volunteer work related to Tibetan culture, education. We can develop Dharmshala along with Ladakh, some part of Jammu and Kashmir for volunteer tourism. There's another form of tourism that has huge potential, also is very popular worldwide, film tourism or movie-based tourism. In this form of tourism, people travel to places where their favorite movies are filmed. For example, in the state of Maharashtra, the state government have been promoting film tourism by setting up tours to visit popular film shooting locations. With Indian films from all regions becoming popular worldwide, this form of tourism also has a great potential. Now let's gather some statistics on tourism. We'll also see how it can usher inclusive growth and what measures Government of India has taken to promote the tourism sector in India. Do you know India has been ranked third just behind US and China in World Travel and Tourism Council's Travel and Tourism Power Ranking. This ranking was given in 2019. In this ranking, the performance of countries from 2011 to 2017 has been taken into account. World Travel and Tourism has taken into account countries' performance in four sectors. Total contribution of the tourism industry to the GDP, the invisible export from the sector, domestic spending on the tourism industry, and the capital investment in the tourism sector. And in the 2019's ranking of World Economic Forum's Travel and Tourism Competitiveness Index, India has been ranked 34 overall. And out of 140 countries, India has been ranked 8th on cultural resources, 13th on price competitiveness, and 14th on natural resources. These rankings are exceedingly good. But the overall ranking of 34 represents something is lacking in the international marketing. As per the 2019 data, travel and tourism in India amounts for approximately 8.1% of total employment opportunities. The sector contributes 9.3% to GDP and it has received 5.9% of total investment. This is exceedingly well. Tourism industry definitely is a sunrise industry in India. It has very high potential of ushering inclusive growth in India. The growth rate of the industry is very high, and the consequential development of infrastructure at the tourist destinations is also huge. With high growth rate, there is high chances of employment and trickle-down effect. And infrastructure development that the sector causes has multiplier effect in the economy. Travel and tourism sector is estimated to create 78 jobs per million rupees invested, compared to 45 jobs when the same amount is invested in the manufacturing sector. 
Like construction sector, tourism industry employs both skilled, semi-skilled or unskilled workers. What is even more regarding this industry is it generates women employment to higher degree compared to other industry. The working condition in this industry is also much better. The forward and backward linkages in the tourism industry is also very high. It promotes agriculture sector, food processing industry, manufacturing, transport, hospitality, education. It is promoter of health and banking industry as well. For inclusive growth, it's important that there is peace and tolerance in society. Tourism industry helps promote peace and stability in developing countries like India. There is a strong promotion of cross-cultural awareness. This helps even more when internal tourism is encouraged. Now let's do the same kind of analysis that we did for the previous topic. We will do that vis-a-vis -vis government's initiative to boost tourism. Number one, is there a policy for tourism industry in India? The answer is yes. There is a national tourism policy that was formulated in 2002. And since 2017, Government of India is in the process of drafting a new policy and has come very close to release it. And how about legislations or schemes in the industry? Well, there are a plethora of schemes that Government of India has come up vis-a-vis -vis the tourism industry. Government of India has launched Incredible India, Sadesh Darshan Scheme, Prasad Scheme, Adopt a Heritage Project, and so hence and so forth. The Incredible India 2.2, the Incredible India 2.0 campaign, marks a major shift from the generic promotion being undertaken across the world to market specific promotional plans and content creation. This is important because we have previously discussed that India is somewhere lacking in the marketing for the tourism sector and that's why a lower ranking in World Tourism Competitiveness Index. The structure that we have talked about before you must look into as to what has been the effort for institutional capacity development in the sector. Online learning management system has been launched by the ministry for creating skilled manpower to work as tourist facilitators. In the tourism administration, a lot has been done actually. For example, Incredible India Tourist Facilitator Certification Portal has been opened. It is an online program where one can learn about tourism on their own. Successful completion of this program would enable the learner to become a certified tourist facilitator of Ministry of Tourism. On the administrative front, Government of India also has come up with facilitative visa regime. And that is extremely important for success of tourism sector in any country. Ministry of Tourism has taken lots of efforts in having a facilitative visa regime along with Ministry of Home Affairs and Ministry of External Affairs. There has been many initiatives to improve the infrastructure in the tourism industry and of important monuments. Ministry also has started Adopt a Heritage Program and the plan under this is to interest heritage sites or any particular monument to private sector and public sector companies and also individuals for development of various tourist amenities in that particular tourist site. As we have talked about before, encouraging internal tourism is of great help. It not only brings socio-economic benefit that we have talked, it also brings internal peace and tolerance promotes intercultural awareness. And the new draft tourism policy that we have been talking about is on the anvil. It is going to give emphasis on technology-enabled development in the tourism industry. See, I've given you some general points, but that is what is required in general studies paper. What's important here is the structure of your answer and that fetch you marks. Now, just like we did in the last discussion, you have to extend this and tell me as to what further can be done. And that suggestion should also have certain structure. Better if you follow the same structure as the structure that we have followed so far in figuring out the initiatives of Government of India. If you have to give suggestions to further improve the industry, your suggestions must also be structured and you can follow this very same structure in that as well. So please do this exercise on your own so that you learn structuring your answer and generating points. Now we shall take up this article from today's newspaper, Developing Schools Without Barriers. One of the main challenge faced by children with disabilities in India is lack of access to education. Several barriers impede the participation of children with disabilities in accessing educational opportunities such as inaccessible school buses, inaccessible facilities in schools like drinking water facilities, canteens accessibility, toilets, there could be uncomfortable seating. 
may be slippery flooring, low illumination. There are also misinformed attitudes and perceptions among parents, teachers, staffs, which further influences the child's emotional development at school. And we are far away from adopting digital equipments, some inclusive technologies, some assistive devices that enhances the learning of children with disability at schools and colleges. Children with disabilities comprise 1.7% of total child population in India as per the census of 2011. And more than 70% of 5 years old with disabilities in India have never attended any educational institution. For a normal child, it is now almost universal education. This data is from one of the UNESCO report of 2019. And even among those children with disability who attend the initial schooling, they tend to drop out as they grow older. The article focuses on the fact that to motivate all children to meaningfully participate in all indoor and outdoor activities without barrier or limitations, the school system has to be made safe, accessible and reliable. And in this regard, let us see some of the measures that the government of India has taken because ultimately these are the things which are important for the exam. First of all, Article 21A of the Constitution and also the right of children to free and compulsory education act 2009 popularly called as rte right to education it outlines the fundamental right to education and the right to have free and compulsory education for children aged 6 to 14 years the sarv siksha abhiyan which adopted the zero rejection policy also emphasizes that every child with special need, irrespective of the kind, category and degree of disability, is provided meaningful and quality education. It includes provision for inclusion of children with disabilities in the mainstream schools, as well as construction of accessible infrastructure and support services, such as special education, assistive technology in imparting education. India also has ratified UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And as a consequence of ratification of this convention, Government of India launched Accessible India Campaign or Sugamya Bharat Abhiyan in 2015. An important pillar of this campaign is accessibility, whether physical or digital or otherwise. The Government of India also has been very supportive of the principle of leave no one behind. This is a promise of 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. There is a body called as the National Trust for the Welfare of Persons with Autism, Cerebral Palsy, Mental Retardation and Multiple Disabilities. The aim of this trust is to provide education, training and rehabilitation services to persons with disabilities including children. There is a scheme called as Inclusive Education for Disabled at Secondary Stage Scheme. This scheme aims to provide education and support services to children with disabilities in secondary schools. It also has one of the important goal of construction of accessible infrastructure. In this context, we shall discuss Accessible India campaign in greater detail because it is a flagship program of Government of India. And whenever there is a flagship program like this one or Mandrega or Sarv Siksha Abhiyan or Digital India, the chances of they being asked in the exam is high. Let's now have a general discussion on Accessible India Campaign. Accessible India Campaign, also alternatively called as Sugamya Bharat Abhiyan, it's a nationwide campaign launched in 2015. The purpose is to achieve universal accessibility for persons with disabilities, the differently abled people. Since the Department of Empowerment of Persons with Disabilities is the nodal agency for most of the programs and initiatives for differently abled people, so this is also the nodal agency under Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment to look after the progress of Accessible India campaign. As we have discussed, there are three verticals for the implementation of this campaign. One is the build infrastructure, the buildings, public places infrastructure. And it is also the case that improving the building infrastructure benefits everyone. It's not just the differently abled people. It helps elderly, it helps people using skates, it helps people using trolleys, it helps in rolling the cradle. The infrastructure useful for differently abled people are useful in general. The second vertical of the campaign is to have the transportation sector accessible. Transportation is vital component for independent living 
and just like other people in society differently able people also use transportation for their movement so accessible transportation is a marker indicator for freedom indicator for liberty indicator of right to movement the third vertical is ICT ecosystem you know that information is power and access to information creates opportunities for everyone in society people use information in many forms to make decisions about their daily lives and this can range from simple reading of price tag to physically enter a hall to participate in an event to read a pamphlet with healthcare information or to understand a train time table or to view web pages so societal barriers of infrastructure in accessible formats stands in the way of obtaining and utilizing information in daily life supreme court also has observed on multiple occasions that access to internet access to social media enables the realization of right to life so the overall vision of accessible india campaign is to create a barrier free environment for independent safe and dignified living for differently able people accessible india campaign has drawn inspiration from united nations convention on rights for persons with disabilities to which india is a signatory and the action plan and targets of accessible india campaign they have been derived from goal 3 of intern strategy this is pronounced as intern it's a place in south korea intern strategy the intern strategy had 10 goals it had goals like to reduce poverty and enhance work and employment prospects promote participation in political progress strengthen social protection expand early intervention and education of children ensuring gender equality ensuring disability inclusive disaster risk reduction and management improving the reliability and comparability of disability data implementation of conventions on the rights of persons with disabilities and advancing sub regional regional and inter regional cooperation the goal number 3 in this strategy is to enhance access to physical environment public transportation knowledge information and communication once crpd this convention on the rights of persons with disabilities came into force bivaco millennium framework and the bivaco plus 5 initiatives was formulated for inclusive barrier free right based society for persons with disabilities in asia and pacific region and after that intern strategy were formulated with specific goals there are 10 goals in this and this includes taking forward the vision of convention on the rights of persons with disabilities and the vision of bivaco millennium framework so convention on the rights of persons with disabilities and bivaco millennium framework are precursors to intern strategy intern strategy itself is precursor to beijing declaration beijing declaration basically was adopted to accelerate the implementation of the intern strategy so it is the goal number 3 of the intern strategy which has formed the pillars of accessible india campaign but to give a legal cover to the campaign and a right to accessibility government of india enacted rights for persons with disabilities act 2016 this act came into force in 2017 and this formed the legal basis for the campaign and with this right to accessibility was not just a welfare measure by the welfare state rather it was the matter of a right for the vyanjan for differently able people if you come to think about it as to why we should ensure access to differently able people you must realize that a disability is disabling only when it prevents someone from doing what they want or need to do for example a lawyer can just be as effective in a wheelchair as other lawyers if he or she has access to the court room and the legal libraries and whatsoever other places and materials and equipments as may be required by a lawyer even if a person can't hear he could be very skilled artisan he could be a very skilled chemist as well even a person with mental illness can nonetheless be a brilliant scholar or a theorist you must have heard of john nash he was a subject of the movie a beautiful mind which you might have seen john nash was awarded nobel prize he was one of the most important mathematician of the second half of 20th century but he, he was suffering from schizophrenia despite that he bagged the nobel prize 
You must have heard of Jim Abbott. He was born without a right hand, but he had a 10-year pitching career in Major League Baseball. By definition, he had disability, but in reality, he has nothing of that kind. So when people with special needs are accommodated, their disabilities don't limit their ability to fully participate in the life. Disability is not disabling. Non-accommodation is. So we must ensure all kind of access to differently able people. Right to dignified life is one of the most basic human right. Dignity is the most fundamental need of human beings. The core of the concept of the right which cannot be covered by some of all other rights is neutralizing the devastating isolation and loss of control over one's life. Discrimination, isolation, that takes away the core of the concept of rights. So to have a right-based society, accessibility is quintessential because people with disabilities, they have the same right as others. They are as much citizen of the state as others. They as much have dignity as human beings as others. So in the spirit of fairness and respect for human life, infrastructure of all kinds must be made accessible to all people. Because of their physical constraints, people with disabilities, they already have difficult life. So it's a simple human decency not to make people's life any harder. As a civilized society, it is our duty to help those in need. It is also said that the character of a man is judged by his conduct, his behavior towards people who are helpless, vulnerable, weak and people who can't give anything in return to him. The concept of a welfare state is based on principles like antodaya. It is based on principles like trusteeship. Treating people in need according to their need is also portrayal of the value system of society. Value system of individuals, organizational values, national values. Differently able people add diversity to society. This diversity is enriching. If they can integrate into the community, they will have the opportunity to make more friends and more people will have the opportunity to know them. It is said that service to man is service to God. In this year, Mains examination in the ethics paper, a quotation was given by UPSC of Eric Erickson. Life without interconnectedness does not make sense. In order to spiritually grow, one have to get into the service of others. Gandhiji has said that the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. It is not about differently able people getting help. It is also about the spiritual rise of the rest of the community by helping them, by catering to their need, by accommodating them, by making the infrastructure of society accessible to them. Modern democracies have welfare nature, but fundamentally all government, whether democracy or otherwise, are under social contract. And to maintain the sanctity of that contract, the sovereign authority has to work for the welfare of all especially for the welfare of more vulnerable people. You must have heard the philosophy, the welfare of one is in the welfare of all. The welfare of all is in the welfare of most vulnerable. This is exactly the case here. Improving the accessibility for differently abled people improves the accessibility for everyone, including families with baby strollers, skateboarders, bicycle riders, for moving the trolley, for moving the rolling table. For any purpose, conveniently, the same infrastructure can be used. If you lower down the floor of the bus, it will not only help the differently able people, but it will help people in general. Translators, escalators, lifts, they are used not only by differently able people, but they are used by very healthy people as well. It generally improves the accessibility and generally helps everyone out. Failing to provide accessibility will actually waste a lot of talent. Stephen Hawking's. If he would not have been provided accessibility, ICT accessibility and otherwise, do you think so much of research work regarding black hole and others would have happened? John Nash, I gave you an example earlier. You must have umpteen number of examples where differently able people have shown that they have beautiful mind. Improving accessibility is also good business. It makes economic sense. For commercial operations of any kind, accessibility means that people with disabilities can become customers increasing sales volumes and profits. Moreover, if a firm is a good place for differently able customers to do business, their reputation, social capital also improves. And now, because of these reasons, a law has been legislated in India. 
so it is a legal mandate to provide accessibility now it has to be done because government now is accountable not only morally but legally too but protecting and promoting the rights of differently able people is not just about providing services making infrastructure accessible to them it is also about adopting measures to change attitude and behavior that stigmatize and marginalize people with disabilities it is also about having policies and laws and programs in place the budgeting must also be done accordingly only then the civil cultural economic political social rights of differently able people can be ensured there is an article on page number 4 in today's newspaper mass mortality of olive ridley turtles in ap raises concern hundreds of olive ridley turtles have been found dead along the coastline between kakinada and antravadi in godavari region of andhra pradesh currently there is a breeding season so they come on shore for breeding but they have been found dead the on shore oil drilling in the nearby region is considered to be one of the cause for high number of deaths of olive ridley turtle we will cover this topic from the perspective of prelims examination knowing the basics about olive ridley turtles first of all olive ridley turtles are the smallest of all turtles and they are the most abundant they inhabit the warm waters of pacific atlantic and indian oceans like most of the turtles they are carnivores turtles can be carnivores omnivores or herbivores but mostly they are either carnivores or omnivores turtles spend most of the time in water tortoises on the other hand spend most of the time on land and they on the other hand are herbivores UPSC has asked a question in the prelims examination of 2019 consider the following statements some species of turtle are herbivores and then it went on to ask some species of fish are herbivores some species of marine mammals are herbivores some species of snakes are viviparous we have just discussed that turtles mostly are carnivores or omnivores and mostly they spend their time in water tortoises on the other hand they are herbivores and they spend most of the time on land but the thing about prelims examination you have to learn is extreme statements are wrong if i say all turtles are carnivores or omnivores that obviously will be a wrong statement the opposite of that will be true and the opposite of that is this some species of turtles are herbivores there is so much diversity maybe some turtle at some stage of their life are herbivores that will make this statement correct In fact all the statements given here are correct one of the turtles found in india green turtles they at the latter stage of their life are herbivores the turtle will be carnivores or herbivores that will depend upon the jaw shape and jaw size and that changes over the period of time olive ridley turtle are listed as vulnerable in the iucn red list so you have to remember that in the iucn red list olive ridley turtle has been categorized as vulnerable and it's there in the appendix 1 of sites and schedule 1 of wildlife protection act 1972 the most characteristic feature of olive ridge turtle is its unique mass nesting it is called as aribada thousands of females come together on the same beach to lay eggs although the nesting site for olive ridge turtle is all along the odisha coast but there are certain areas which are important and they are famous for mass nesting and they are at the mouth of three rivers river dharma river devi and rushi kulia river and at the mouth of river dharma there is gahir mata marine sanctuary this entire region of wetland formed by these three rivers has three important protected area bitarkanika national park bitarkanika wildlife sanctuary and gahir mata marine sanctuary olive ridley turtles they are poached for their meat for their shell their leather their eggs but the most severe threat they face is the accidental killing through the entanglement in troll nets and to reduce such accidental killing the odisha government has made it mandatory for trolls to use turtle excluder devices it's a net specially designed for an exit cover which allows the turtle to escape while retaining the rest of the catch You must also know that altogether there are five species of sea turtle known to inhabit Indian coastal water, and apart from olive ridley turtle, the other four are green turtle, hawksbill turtle, loggerhead turtle, and leatherback turtle. And except for the loggerhead turtle, the remaining four species nest along Indian coast. 
With this, we have come to the end of the session. Thank you very much for being with me. Goodbye. Take care.